it's a real uh, honor to to be here in in Prague and and in this country and and be standing with this uh, book in the in in the, in the Czech language, uh, especially because I believe, and I'm not just saying this to to flatter you that th that this country has played an an outsized role in the history of free speech, you know, from Jan Hus, uh, who was uh, who was executed as a as a heretic, as an early Christian uh, reformer, uh, to uh, to the plastic people of the universe, uh, these uh, sort of psychedelic uh, rockers who were who were being prosecuted for their for their creative descent, to Havel, who who remains probably, at least in my opinion, perhaps the most inspiring. Uh, dissident and, and democracy proponent, and perhaps to someone a little less famous called Yuri Gans, who was sentenced to 15 years in prison in 1979 for, among other things, founding the club of Friends of American Music, where he committed such hor horrible crimes as spreading jazz and rock music to uh, undermining the socialist state system of, uh, of, of, of Czechoslovakia as it was uh, in the time. Now, my talk will be on what I call the free speech recession and how to, and how to end it. <clears throat> and, and you might sort of say, what, what free speech uh, recession? Um, because in, in many ways, uh, speech is, is all around us. And, but, I, but I would argue that we've gone from, from a golden age um, uh, that starting uh, around the, the, the the, the 70s, sort of a third wave of democracy uh, where free speech played a crucial role. And there were some really uh, uh, monumental gains. So two very iconic ones was, of course, the end of communism um, and the other, uh, the end of apartheid. And, and uh, you see here two, two symbols of that in, in Havel and, and Mandela. And uh, I think both of them articulated uh, very powerfully the central importance of freedom of expression and access to information for toppling uh, authoritarian, deeply repressive regimes. And also how censorship and repression is crucial to systems uh, of oppression. You cannot have a totalitarian or authoritarian state without controlling access to information, without suppressing uh, dissent. Um, um, and so, you know, the, uh, the, the 90s especially is a, 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 a period of, of great optimism. And, you know, there was good reasons for that. And, and there would be, uh, you would have, there's, there's just a bit of delay. Yeah, okay. And, and then came another game changer, which was, of course, the internet. Um, and here you see... Uh, the very often quoted Declaration of the Independence of, of Cyberspace by, by John Perry Barlow in, in, uh, in, uh, in 1996, which has this uh, very techno-optimistic ideal of a radically de decentralized space of the internet where governments will have no power, where everyone can be free to express themselves without no, uh, with, with no means of governments to really stop uh, uh, or, or impose uh, limitations. Um, and this uh, ideal um, was generally, I think, supported by, um, by governments for a long time, including this, inclu okay, including this guy, um, um, Barack Obama, who back in 2006 was a junior senator from Illinois, uh, and uh, on his website, uh, he, he, he wrote about uh, the importance of net neutrality and he released this podcast where he talked about how the internet allowed him to say what he wanted without censorship. It basically, it allowed him to bypass uh, traditional gatekeepers and he used uh, social media, him and, and his campaign, to, to spectacular effect winning the so-called Facebook generation. It's really interesting. If you go back and look at the coverage of the Obama campaigns in 2008 and 2012, you will see that the campaign is praised in mainstream media for its use of social media <laughs> to obtain data about, uh, about voters and about how to energize and reach voters, uh, something that uh, in 2016 would be seen as very dangerous uh, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to democracy. So, so, but, but I think uh, Obama here in 2006 channels sort of still the optimism about free speech um, uh, powered by, uh, by, by the internet, by, by the nascent social media 
um, maybe more the blockosphere at, at, at this point of time. Um, and it's certainly true that um, quantitatively, we, um, that, you know, there's never been more speech available to, 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 to all of us. So, so this, uh, here you see back in 2012, IBM claimed that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years. So that was 10 years ago. And that figure has, I cannot imagine how, is it, how it has just grown exponentially. And in every minute of 2021, 4 million videos were streamed on YouTube, 500,000 tweets were, were shut off, and, and 500,000 comments uploaded on, uh, on Facebook. Now, not all of those comments were perhaps uh, uh, entailed wisdom in the way that, that John might de 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 define it. Uh, some of them uh, included uh, um, hateful messages, some of them uh, disinformation, uh, uh, and, and so on. But, but of course, I mean, no, no, no other generation in the history of the world has had the same opportunity as those of us alive today to be able to communicate immediately um, uh, across borders uh, to potentially billions uh, of people. So why, why is there a free speech recession if we've, 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 we've sort of had these great triumphs, toppling communism, top, uh, toppling apartheid, uh, seeing an expanded number of democracies, uh, and so on? Well, um, for instance, you can look at the number of journalists imprisoned, and there you see a, a troubling uh, trend if you look at, at data from the Committee to Protect Journalists. So we see um, a, a huge increase uh, in, uh, so in, in 2021, 293 recorded instances. One stat that I didn't uh, include is that journalists who are now imprisoned on the, the, the basis of, charge, of the charge false information has also grown exponentially over the past uh, decade. And actually, even though you know, there's an exponential amount of, of data around, internet freedom is actually in decline. Uh, and if you use Freedom House's uh, definition, they would say that global internet freedom has declined for more than a decade. So 80% of, of countries, people were arrested or convicted for online speech. In 20 co uh, countries, government shut off the internet. Um, and in 21 states blocked social media and communication platforms. Um, uh, and, and you see that, uh, of course, uh, in, in, in a lot of states, uh, you see that in Iran, you see it in, uh, in Russia, uh, and so on. But, you know, it's, 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 it's not surprising that authoritarian states would use censorship in the digital age. So free speech has its origins in the Athenian democracy, and the, the Athenian democracy was overthrown on a number of occasions in 411 and 404 BC, and, 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 and each, each of the time by these oligarchs, and each of the time, you know, limiting free speech was, 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 was uh, central to these efforts. So, so ever since 411 BC, um, censorship and control of information has been on, on page one of the dictator's uh, playbook. But what we see today, and which I think is especially worrying, is that democracies are now contributing to the free speech recession, uh, especially in, in our digital era. So let me give you an example. Germany is famously concerned about the, the limits of free speech for, for historical reasons. Uh, and I'll come back to a, maybe a, a bit of a provocative thesis of, of why I think they get their own history uh, wrong. Uh, big claim. Um, but Germany is, is extremely worried about, uh, about, especially about hate speech. But, but Germany criminalizes a lot of speech compared to, to uh, uh, many other democracies. And so in 2017, Germany adopted a law which says that manifestly illegal content has to be removed by uh, intermediaries like Facebook, um, YouTube, and others within 24 hours, or these platforms can risk fines of up to 50 million euros. Now, what does that mean? That, on the one hand, that gives a huge incentive to the platforms to remove much more uh, content than, they, than, they, than, than they're required uh, to do. And in fact, lots of data suggests that uh, what, what really happens is that the, the platforms just expand their terms. So if the, if the definition of illegal content, say hate speech under German law is here, Facebook and YouTube will, will make a definition that is this broad to ensure 
that they err on the side uh, of removing illegal content. And what they also do is they'll use automated content moderation. So they use a very broad and vague standard, which they will then supercharge by, by, by automated content moderation, sort of harvesting lots of, and then the, the German government can come back and say, well, there's no over-implementation because the process uh, set up for, com for complaining through the NetCG doesn't, doesn't show over-implementation, but what they've really done is outsource censorship, if you like, to uh, private companies, um, and, and even though they don't use the formal legal procedure. What's even more pernicious, perhaps, is, so my organization has done two reports where we've sort of looked at the international picture, and we see that a number of authoritarian states have more or less copy-pasted the, the German law uh, to provide a facade of legitimacy to their own internet censorship. So this includes Russia, uh, um, Venezuela, uh, Belarus, uh, Turkey. Um, and of course, it's not that these countries wouldn't use censorship uh, of the online sphere uh, if Germany hadn't done so, but it's that when they do so and they can point to a European democracy, a very influential European democracy, as, as having sort of forged ahead, it provides them sort of, um, uh, well, a, a, a facade of legitimacy, but also what a boundary point. So when democracies criticize them, well, you're cracking down on, uh, on, on, on dissidents. You shouldn't do that. Well, you're doing the same. You have these laws where, you know, we might have different uh, interpretations of what constitute hate speech and disinformation, but we're basically doing the same as you. So you're blurring the very bright line that, in my opinion, is crucial between liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes, even if the Russian version is much more and more expansive. It doesn't uh, have uh, rule of law protection, doesn't have uh, independent courts that, can, that, that are the safeguards that are in place uh, in, in Germany. David has already mentioned the Digital Services Act, so this comprehensive European uh, Union approach to try and, and regulate what is often called the Wild West uh, of the online sphere. It's a, it's, a, it's a term that I hate because I think it's, it's not only a cliche, I don't also think it's, it's actually quite misleading. Um, um, but, 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 and, and so it's, it's a huge complex of, of laws, but one of the, the, one of the, the parts of it is a, a notice and takedown procedure, which basically means that uh, platforms have to remove content that is, that is uh, illegal under, uh, in, in, the, in the law where the platform operates. And if you look at the European Union, you will see that there are huge differences in what is permissible speech. And you will see that a number of countries have quite troubling, at least from a pro-free speech perspective. So, so, so this could be Poland and Austria uh, that has uh, blasphemy laws that are, that are actually actively uh, being used. Uh, it could be Hungary on anti-LGBT. Um, it could be Germany with very, very um, vague and broad hate speech laws. It could be um, some countries where they ban communist uh, symbols. It could be in Spain where rappers have been sentenced to prison for, for glorifying terrorism due to their, due, due to their uh, lyrics. Uh, so a broad swath of, uh, of speech that will essentially be required to be uh, um, um, uh, removed by, by these uh, tech giants with, um, uh, in, in accordance with processes which the DSA says has to live up to some standards of due process, but which I think will be impossible to, to satisfy, and I'll, I'll, come back to, uh, and I'll come back to that. But what is, what, why do we, why, why are democracies, why have they become so afraid of, of, of free speech? Why is there a tendency for democracies now to restrict free speech when, when if we go back a couple of decades, they would support it? Um, so I'll suggest that what I call elite panic plays a, a role. So you remember the, the quote that I had from Barack Obama in 2006. Now in 2020, after the US election and, and Donald Trump's sort of uh, 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 insidious campaign to, to, to challenge the result through blatant uh, lies and conspiracy theories, Obama suddenly now thought of the, the online sphere and especially disinformation as the single biggest threat to democracy. And um, elite panic is not a new phenomenon. So I mentioned that free speech goes back to, 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 to ancient Athens. Um, 
and, and, and that was, a, uh, for its time, a very egalitarian model. So there were two overlapping concepts of free speech in, in ancient Athens. One of them called isagoria, meaning something like equality of speech. So that would be all freeborn male citizens who had a direct voice uh, and ability to vote on political affairs, adopt laws in the assembly, in the ecclesia. But there was also a, a broader cultural element called parisia, meaning something like uninhibited speech, which basically is a, a commitment to tolerance of social dissent. So that would allow someone like Plato to set up an academy and, and, and teach philosophical directions that were actually hostile to the very democracy which allowed him to thrive. It would also allow people to poke fun at religion and, uh, and gods. As Socrates found out, the tolerance uh, of, uh, of parasia was not uh, unlimited, and, and it showed one of the, the flaws of the Athenian system in that it didn't, wasn't based on our conception of individual rights. It didn't include separation of powers and so on, and it would be one of the things that was improved upon uh, later on. But basically, it was an, a, a, a radically, for its time, egalitarian model. Then we have a competing concept uh, based uh, on, on Roman republicanism, which where, where the Romans would also, they, they wouldn't have a, a, specific, a specific term for, for free, free speech. It was part of, of their commitment to libertas or, or, or liberty, but it was a much more top-down elitist conception of free speech. So if you were in, a, in an assembly in the Roman Republic, it would be the magistrate that addressed the people, the ordinary people would not have a right to speak for themselves, unlike the Greeks. Someone like Cicero was a big fan of, of Greek culture, of oratory. He hailed the ability to think and, and, and speak. But it had to be the elite. It had to be people like Cicero himself. Because once you opened up the assemblies um, to ordinary people, to the unwashed mob, they were far too, you know, these were simpletons with, with, with dangerous ideas that could not be uh, allowed to, to be aired uh, freely. In fact, Cicero believed that that was the reason for Greece's downfall, the fact that you had allowed these simpletons into the assemblies and, and decide matters that should be left to the elite. Of course, things didn't really go so well for Cicero uh, uh, and the elite in, in, at the end of the Roman Republic uh, uh, for themselves. But ever since, I believe this conflict between an egalitarian and an elitist model of free speech has uh, been in tension and, and outbreaks of elite panic tend to uh, be especially prominent when the public sphere is expanded through radical uh, developments in communication technology or the franchise is expanded to previously marginalized persecuted groups. So the, uh, the printing press is, a, of course, a, a great example. And uh, here you have uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam, one of the great uh, Renaissance uh, uh, men of, uh, and someone who, who wrote a lot. You know, you, you really have to uh, keep, uh, be very productive to keep up with Erasmus. And he was, for his time, quite sort of open to, to religious tolerance and so on. But in 1525, uh, Erasmus writes that printers fill the world, world with pamphlets and books that are foolish, ignorant, malignant, libelous, mad, impious, and subversive. Um, and, and of course, this uh, is at a time where there's been a pretty explosive cocktail where the printing press meets an honorary German monk called Martin Luther and everything just explodes. Uh, so uh, initially, Erasmus thinks that the printing press is, is great. Even the church believes the printing press is great because it allows to spread good ideas, truth. Uh, but suddenly, when, when, when uh, the, the printed word is being spread out to everyone, then suddenly all kinds of ideas are floated and they erode institutional authority. They erode the religious authority of the church. They erode the authority of uh, secular uh, rulers. Secular rulers see uh, a great idea of breaking away from the church because suddenly they get to, to decide uh, many more things. And when you open up uh, uh, religion to ordinary people, people will start getting their own ideas uh, and that of course, inverts uh, authority. And so here's, this is a great example of elite panic um, early on. Now, the New York Times, 1858, um, the, 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 the Transoceanic uh, Telegraph suddenly allows, you know, uh, information to cross continents that would previously have taken weeks. And suddenly you could do it uh, almost instantaneously. And what does the New York Times conclude? 
Well, they say that there can be no rational doubt that the telegraph has caused vast injury, superficial, sudden, unsifted, too fast for the truth, must be all telegraphic intelligence. Uh, so an another good example of what happens with uh, communications technology. And the last example I will take, I'll use um, um, technology uh, allowing, is uh, John B. Whitten, uh, an eminent uh, prof uh, professor from Princeton University. He wrote this at a time where the United Nations was discussing where the limits on propaganda and disinformation should be uh, at the global level. And John B. Whitten says something really interesting. He says, well, yes, John, Mil John Milton and John Stuart Mill had some great ideas about free speech and truth, uh, and they were relevant 100 years ago, but not today, because now we have the shortwave radio and beam propaganda of subversive and revolutionary uh, propaganda, uh, propaganda. And so you see that many of these arguments, you know, if you, if, you, if you take away the printing press, if you take away the telegraph, you take away the radio, and you insert social media on the internet, it's basically the same impulse that, um, that, 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 that people are afraid of the consequences. And of course, it is true, and it has always been the truth, that free speech has uh, has consequences. It comes with, co with, 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 with harms and costs. It would be uh, difficult to imagine the attack on the Capitol on January 6th without social media, for instance, it played, a, played a huge role in spreading uh, corrosive, um, uh, corrosive uh, conspiracy theories which, which, which were compelling enough to some to, 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 to act violently. But I would say that still, Free speech is the most important uh, human right. Um, in fact, I would say that um, free speech, uh, sh and, and, and you know, in addition to, to, to sort of the elite panic I mentioned, I think there's another well-intentioned reason why modern democracies tend to limit free speech, and that is a concern out of equality and tolerance, which is born out of a good place, wanting to avoid the, the sins of the past where uh, racial, uh, religious minorities have been persecuted up to and including, of course, uh, mass genocide. Uh, but, but again, I will argue here that, that free speech is the most important right, and that is perhaps especially important for minorities, and that free speech is not only the antithesis of violence, it is also the most powerful engine of human equality that our species has ever stumbled upon. I'll try to demonstrate this point with a, with a number of examples. So Frederick Douglass is perhaps my favorite um, proponent of free speech. He was, a, a, an, he was born in, a, as a slave uh, in, in the US, but, but, but ran away and became sort of a, a very famous orator and abolitionist who, who argued convincingly uh, uh, for the ab uh, abolishment of, uh, of slavery. And in 1845, Douglas says that the right of speech is a very precious one, especially to the oppressed. And so in, in 1860, Frederick Douglass is in Boston at, um, and, and he goes to a church uh, where there's supposed to be an abolitionist meeting and he's supposed to give a speech. But a number of white Bostonians disrupt, violently disrupt this meeting. They don't like abolitionists because they hurt their commercial interest in the South and they, they, they think their activities will, will lead to civil war, which might not have been completely uh, off. Um, um, uh, uh, and so a week later, Douglas finds another venue in Boston where he holds, gives a speech called a plea, free, a plea for free speech uh, in Boston, which I, I think uh, nails uh, just about every uh, controversy we still we have about free speech uh, very succinctly it's like maybe two pages uh, long and and what Douglas concludes is that a man's right to speak does not depend upon where he was born or upon his color the simple quality of manhood is the solid basis of the right and there let it rest forever so he, Frederick Douglas basically comes up with this egalitarian universal ideal uh, of free speech. He also comes up with another, which I think is, is, is a really important argument. He says free speech is not only about the individual right of the speaker who's suppressed. It's also, in, in, in a sense, a collective right of the listener to, 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 to obtain different perspectives. Uh, even if you don't like what is being said, it can challenge you, it can force you to rethink your, your arguments, and, and if you, even if you broadly disagree, you might change your mind 5% or 10%, uh, 
uh, uh, to the benefit uh, of, us, uh, of, of us all. Um, uh, and, and, um, and basically, Frederick Douglass makes the argument that, slave, that, that if you have free speech, uh, slavery will die. And he has a strong point, I think, because what we saw at, at, in the 1830s in the United States, even though you had a First Amendment that was very speech protective on paper, Southern states adopted the most speech restrictive laws in American history. So basically, if you were in Alabama and you were to argue against uh, slavery, you could formally be put to death. Uh, and there were sort of really, really strict uh, laws in the South about what you could say about, uh, uh, about slavery. Um, we'll fast forward um, to uh, history that might be more familiar to, to, to people in this room. Um, uh, of, of course, the famous uh, dissidents of, of, uh, of Charter uh, 77. Um, uh, and, and this is, of course, after the arrest of the, of the plastic people of, of, of the universe, uh, this uh, psychedelic rock group that had sort of poked fun of, of, the, of the regime in, in, in sort of subversive way. But it was also after the adoption of the Helsinki Final Act. So this, the Helsinki Final Act was basically this broad agreement about, uh, uh, about Europe between the democratic West and, and, the, and, and, and the communist East. And, and the, the Helsinki Final Act included human rights provisions, and they were sort of expanded to talk about the need for freedom of expression, open journalism, uh, and so on. And the, the communists thought, well, this is just you know, something on paper. We don't have to live up to it. But the Helsinki Final Act actually empowered dissidents behind the Iron Curtain in very important ways, and it created a positive feedback loop between Western governments, new NGOs like what would become Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, to shine a light on the egregious abuses of free speech in, in communist states, give a voice to, uh, to activists who could then say, well, you signed these documents. You have, uh, you have actually, you, you, you agreed to respect our rights to free speech. You are not. And so if you look at the famous Charter 77, the very first right that was seized upon by Havel and, and his co-conspirators, if I may use that word, was freedom of expression in Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a human rights uh, treaty adopted to, to, to protect a number of, of uh, classical uh, freedoms. And you saw the same thing in a number of other uh, countries in, in, the, in the Soviet uh, Union where the Helsinki watch groups uh, were formed. You saw it in Poland uh, uh, and so on. So, so, and so here we see that you know, where today democratic governments have become much more suspicious about free speech, see free speech to a certain degree as a threat to democracy and their own values at the time they were actively supporting, promoting free speech as, as the best way to uh, subvert communism and as a bulwark for their own uh, um, liberal democratic values. Not that they consistently lived up to them, but, um, but, but I'm pretty certain that things, even though I wasn't born until 1978, I'm pretty certain that things in Denmark in 1977 were quite a bit better when it comes to free speech than in this country. Um, on the other hand, look at this statement from the Soviet ambassador to, uh, to, the, to, to, to uh, the, the, the CSCE, where the framework of the Helsinki Agreement. Now, the Soviets sort of were a bit hesitant about the whole idea about free speech because it was not part and parcel of, 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 of the Soviet state. But, so he says, there can be new, no room for the dissemination of anti-culture, pornography, racism, fascism, the cult of violence, hostility among peoples, and false slanderous propaganda. Now look at some of these terms. Some of these terms are the very same that democracies today use to limit free speech. They're the same obsessions about racism, fascism, slanderous propaganda, uh, disinformation. And that is not a uh, co uh, um, um, coincidence. Um, I'll get back to that. Um, this uh, is an iconic moment. It's, uh, it's Havel, shortly, shortly after being uh, released from prison, um, and and, um, and 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 the, the collapse uh, with, uh, of, of communism with the Velvet Revolution and everything, and he's invited to speak at the U.S. Congress. And there he says, when they arrested me on October 27, I was living in a country ruled by the most conservative communist government in Europe, and our society slumbered beneath the pall of a totalitarian system. Today, less than four months later, 
I'm speaking to you as the representative of a country that has set out on the road to democracy, a country where there's complete freedom of speech. So you see Havel again, um, really underlining the essential uh, insepar inseparable uh, um, connection between free speech uh, and democracy. And you could see some of the same things in, when it comes to racial uh, justice in the US. I mentioned slavery. Of course, at the end of slavery, things were not rosy and peachy when it comes to, to race relations in, in the US. There was still, there was still um, blatant um, racial uh, segregation. And the civil rights movement in the US fought vigorously uh, against that. And one of the most potent tools of the civil rights movement was, uh, was free speech. And one of the reasons why the, the First Amendment today uh, includes such strong protections that, that, that are more speech protective than, than most European laws is actually because the civil rights movement won a number of landmark cases. Some, take, take New York Times versus Sullivan, sort of a classic case. Well, that was a civil rights case. Uh, or Edwards versus South Carolina, where you know um, black students were peacefully protesting in South Carolina and, and they were then arrested um, uh, and here you see John Lewis, who, who was a civil rights leader, but also a congressman. He was frequently arrested. One time he was arrested in Dallas for standing with a sign that read, one man, one vote. Um, and uh, John Lewis, when he looked back at this epic struggle that he had been part of, he said that without freedom of speech and the right to dissent, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. Um, okay, so you might say, yes, we agree that of course, free speech is important for, for democracy. It is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a necessary uh, precondition for democracy. It's also important for equality, but we have to balance it uh, against uh, certain potential harms and evils. And that's why democracies need to be intolerant of, intolerance, of, 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 of intolerance, to, to use uh, Karl Popper's famous paradox of, of tolerance. Uh, and therefore, uh, democracies must have narrow limits on specific viewpoints and ideologies uh, in order to safeguard democracy itself. Now, this is what I'd like to challenge. Now, that idea is very much based, of course, on the lessons of the collapse of the Weimar Republic in Germany that lasted from 1918 to 1933 and the rise of Nazism. Um, but, um, building on, on the work of, of a British scholar called Eric Heinze, I call this the Weimar fallacy, because when you look at the Weimar Republic, it actually included a number of quite stringent restrictions on free speech. So the radio was completely off guards to, to Nazis and communists, and there were increasingly draconian emergency laws which allowed the government to administratively ban newspapers that uh, spread false information or attack the government. And so someone like Josef Goebbels, who would later become propaganda minister, uh, founded a newspaper when Hitler was banned from speaking in a number of, of countries called uh, Der Angriff, the attack, which basically engaged in what today we call anti-Semitic uh, trolling. And he would boast about how the ban, you know, the, 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 Der Angriff was the most frequently banned daily in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Germany. Um, Julius Streicher, uh, who, who was uh, the editor of the Stürmer, the most sickeningly anti-Semitic newspaper, was, was sentenced to prison to, uh, f several times, uh, including uh, for anti-Semitic uh, uh, viewpoints. Um, but most dangerously, I think, is that these emergency laws, and indeed the very emergency um, provision in the Weimar Constitution, which allowed the president to suspend civil liberties, was used by the Nazis when they came into power. So even before the Reichstag fire, the Nazis uh, used an emergency law against fake news to shut down social democratic uh, newspapers. Then when the Reichstag fire came, they leaned on President Hindenburg to suspend all civil liberties. And then you had used the measures that were supposed to protect democracy, to abolish democracy, create a one-party state where uh, you could, without impunity, imprison, kill, uh, torture um, um, political opponents, and you had, in, in, uh, in essence, a, a, a totalitarian uh, state. Um, interestingly enough, if you go to, the, to, to the, the, the Soviet constitution of 1936, i.e. under Stalin, you see there that the, uh, any advocacy of racial or nation, national exclusiveness or hatred and contempt is punishable by law. So you had within the Soviet tradition 
uh, also laws against what we today would, would call hate speech. Um, I think you can guess how these laws were being used. Um, um, and, and what we saw also was that, oh, uh, what we saw also was that um, after, after World War II, a number of peace treaties, for instance, were, were made with Romania, Bulgaria, and, and Hungary that, 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 that obliges these countries to ban fascism and also to ban movements that were anti-democratic. Uh, uh, and uh, how did that go? Well, this is a telegram from the US envoy uh, to Hungary back to the State Department in 1947. And he highlights that these, um, these measures will uh, basically be used to, by the communist government to suppress uh, all dissent, which uh, of course is, uh, uh, is, is what happened. So they became, became sort of a Trojan horse uh, that, that could be used. Um, and you saw that um, when the Soviet uh, representative in the United Nations uh, was, was, was attacked by the US and other states, he said that, um, that, um, that, that this, these countries, uh, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania, have guaranteed human rights protections. Uh, they have repealed discriminatory legislation uh, and taken me measures to disband fascist organizations. And uh, basically, the, the, the reason why they had censorship and sent people in prison was because they were fascists. And of course, the definition of fascism in these communist regimes was anyone who was disagreement with, 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 with communism. So whether you were a social democrat or a liberal, uh, you were a fascist uh, and you could be uh, repressed. Um, here you can, uh, you, can, you can actually see that the Soviet side took this a step further. So when there was a discussion at the United Nations about where should the lines be drawn on free speech in international human rights law, the Soviets actively promoted the idea that free speech should be limited by an obligation to prohibit hate speech and uh, disinformation, uh, uh, something that they were ultimately successful in doing with the ICCPR. Uh, um, interestingly, Eleanor Roosevelt was very prophetic in her uh, resistance to this idea. She warned that if you allowed governments to prohibit uh, uh, hate speech that would be used uh, uh, and abused by totalitarian states to crack down on, uh, on free speech. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, that's what happened. And these uh, laws have had a long afterlife. So even when, when, when communism was died, uh, had, had died, uh, a number of Islamic states used the provisions that were originally uh, uh, inserted by, by, by communist states uh, in Article 20 of the ICCPR to claim that attacks on religion would, was, was a form of hate speech that should be prevented. You saw that with the, with the Rushdie affair, but you've also seen it uh, afterwards, like when uh, a newspaper in my home country of Denmark published cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, you would see that the, 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 the member states of the um, of the OIC, um, 47 or 49 uh, Muslim majority states, demanded that the UN change the whole, invert basically the relationship between free speech and tolerance at that criticism of religion, uh, uh, and most importantly, Islam, should be prohibited as racist uh, hate speech under uh, Article uh, 20. Um, I'm trying to go forward here. Um, so, as I mentioned uh, briefly, today, um, even today, uh, I would say that the way that democracies are now leaning on, uh, in our digital age, on, on platforms, is, is creating some of the, 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 the same perverse uh, and uh, unintended consequences. So uh, my organization did, um, uh, uh, last year I think it was, we did sort of a, a survey of a number of, um, uh, of um, Facebook accounts of Danish politicians and media uh, outlets. Um, and we, uh, we, we, we basically found that out of uh, six, we, we, we analyzed a, a sample of 2,400 hateful comments on Facebook, but found that only 
0.46% uh, of them would actually violate the Danish criminal code. So these were, uh, but these were, were, were comments that would be hateful in accordance with, uh, with, with, with uh, Facebook's uh, definition thereof. So out of the 63 million comments, if we extrapolate that, that would mean that it's 0.66% uh, 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 illegal comments that are left up. But the narrative that is driving the rush to uh, remove content is that basically uh, social media is drowning in illegal content. Now, of course, this is not a representative universal uh, model, but it's something that suggests that, uh, that, that maybe, again, we're living through a time of elite panic where we focus incessantly on the dark sides of free speech and take all the benefits for granted. And when we elevate those concerns into laws, the cure will be uh, will be worse uh, uh, than the disease, and we will remove a lot of content uh, that is perfectly uh, legal, um, which should con con concern us, I, uh, I think, if we care about free speech. My final point um, is that, you know, what should we do? I promised to give you a solution to the free speech recession, and here it is. Um, <laughs> we'll solve it today. Uh, now, I, I think, ultimately, free speech depends on, a, on, on culture. So it depends, you know, where you, how you draft the laws. Laws, of course, important, but ultimately the most important thing is a civic commitment to social dissent among a critical mass of citizens. That you view the fact that, you know, you have very different ideas about politics, religion, philosophy, and you can still be compatriots neighbors, friends, spouses, um, and, and that's what I mean about uh, free speech being the antithesis of violence. So if you are a Hussite today in the Czech Republic, I doubt very much that you would be burned on the stake. Uh, you can do so, you can even reject re religion. I, I believe famously the Czech Republic is one of the least religious uh, countries uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Europe. Um, and, 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 and you know, uh, you can hold political ideas, religious ideas that we'd once go to war over because we thought they were so dangerous to the social cohesion necessary for, function, for, for a state to, to, to function that, it would, that we would be doing, you know, that, that it was a, a thing of good to execute a, her, a heretic or, or imprison uh, uh, heretic. We've changed that. We now see it uh, as a strength. And that, I think, is, is, is really what we need. And, and I think that George Orwell said it, uh, um, said, it, said it very good. He said, the point is that the relative freedom which we enjoy depends on public opinion. If large numbers of people are interested in freedom of speech, there will be freedom of speech even if the law forbids it. If public opinion is sluggish, inconvenient minorities will be persecuted even if laws exist to protect them. Thank you very much. Uh, Jacob, thank you very much for that fascinating talk. And uh, I actually want to draw on uh, what you just uh, on, on on the on the bit that you just finished with. Uh, it's because it is important not just to uphold the principles and the laws that uh, uh, protect freedom of expression, but also to support uh, the culture of free expression. Uh, and that is also why we are very excited when we found out about your book that came out this March in English, and we're very eager to translate it into Czech, and only yesterday we got it from, from the printer. So we've got the book here, fresh from the printer, and before we get to the Q&A session here, since we have Jacob here, we would like to baptize it uh, here with you. Uh, so that's uh, maybe for the uh, English speakers here. We've got the tradition that similar, like you baptize a baby, we baptize books, not with water, but with champagne. <laughs> uh, so I would like to invite uh, my colleague, who was actually a translator of the book, to be the champagne bearer. Uh, and I would like to invite Jacob down here, because we, for some reason we need to be here so that the camera can see us, to be the uh, book holder. And... Before we get to the baptism itself, uh, I, if we're lucky, we might actually be in touch via uh, the internet. 
with the godmother, or as she wants to, uh, uh, she wants to be uh, int uh, introduced as the godless mother of the book, uh, who is Nadine Strossen, the uh, former president of the American Civil Rights. So no, American ACLU. So, Yes, ACLU. Yeah, the American Civil Liberties Union. My apologies. And we have Nadine over here. So, so before we get to the baptism, uh, I would just like to um, give uh, the word to Nadine, uh, who will just quickly um, who will have, have uh, a few words to say about the book and about free speech and how important it is. Well, I have really, really enjoyed as much as I was able to hear of Jakob's terrific presentation. I'm so sorry that I'm not able to be there in person on this memorable occasion, uh, baptizing Jakob's important book and participating in this wonderful conference. I feel such a strong professional bond to uh, Institute H21 and such a strong personal bond to Adam and all of his colleagues and also to Jakob. But thanks to Zoom, I'm able to participate a bit. And the same thing happened last year with my book, Baptism. Uh, it's a wonderful tradition, which I had never heard of. And to this day, I have never met anybody else who has ever heard of it outside of the Czech Republic. But every time I tell my friends and colleagues uh, elsewhere about it, they just say this is really a great tradition. So uh, even though it's in the morning here, I came prepared with my own bottle of champagne. Um, and of course, I came prepared with my own mostly empty bottle of Slivovitz. And uh, Adam, it's not the really great one that you and your colleagues were so kind as to give me last year. Me this is many successors later. <laughs> it was a, a taste that I very quickly acquired as a, one of my many wonderful uh, souvenirs from that visit. Um, it was also an incredible honor for my book first to be part of a pair uh, of the first two that were translated by IH21 with uh, John Stuart Mills on Liberty. And here, you know, my favorite prop, which is just, again, even a better gift than the sleeve of it, which is saying a lot. Uh, Adam was so kind when I saw this cap in his office, I immediately fell in love with it, and he was so generous as to uh, give it to me. And it is now my constant travel companion. Uh, I It has traveled with me far and wide to illustrate constant talks about free speech and intellectual freedom. And as Jakob well knows, uh, Jakob and Adam know, uh, it was featured in the Wall Street Journal, a very nice uh, a long interview that was done with me last month. And uh, the journalist was so taken by the cap, which I put on as an illustration that he uh, depicted that uh, in the accompanying photograph. So now I've gotten so many requests, as you know, Adam, uh, various organizations want to be able to adopt this cap as their own with, with attribution to you. Uh, oh, and by the way, let me say, be, yesterday I spoke at Yale University and I used this cap and the students said to me, they had seen the picture of it in the Wall Street Journal and they got so excited. It was like meeting an actual celebrity. We saw it in the Wall Street Journal. We're so happy you brought it with you. Okay, um, so it was great to be part of the um, the duo, but now that we have a trilogy with, with Jakob's amazing book, um, it's just really more of an honor than ever to be participating in those um, those translations. And I noticed that this is the translation of my book. I noticed the same color uh, combination, the red, black. I don't know if that's a uh, coincidence on Jakob's book, but they're just so fantastically designed um, as well as the, obviously a content in, in Jakob's case is fantastic as well. Um, his great book parallels his wonderful podcast. If you haven't read one and listened to the other, you have big treats in store for you. Uh, they reflect absolutely, you know, overwhelmingly prodigious research, meticulous analysis, inspiring insights, and prose that ranges from the articulate to the eloquent. Uh, the book includes many memorable, quotable passages. I've certainly been quoting and citing it 
constantly in both speaking and writing. And what's even more significant is I'm constantly hearing references to it in so many places and so many forums, both on campus and off campus by many thought leaders that I respect. So the book already has been making a really big splash. And now that it's in check, it's gonna obviously make an even bigger uh, splash. Adam asked me, in addition to saluting Jakob's wonderful book, also asked me to say uh, just a few words about the state of free speech in the world. So here are my four words about the state of free speech. It could be better. <laughs> and thanks to Jakob's book and to IH21's efforts and this conference, I am hopeful and confident that it will be better. So that's a total of, of nine words um, it, this, about the state of free speech. It could be better and it will be better. Uh, so I'm going to comment just very briefly and to amplify on those nine words. And I'm going to focus on the U.S., although I'm deeply aware of even graver problems elsewhere. So I never lose sight of how much how fortunate we still are and how much worse it could be. But that is exactly why we must maintain the proverbial eternal vigilance uh, statement of phrase attributed to Thomas Jefferson. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty because I have no doubt that we would continue to backslide in a heartbeat. Uh, the First Amendment, wonderful uh, words on a piece of paper, but uh, can easily lose all uh, actual meaning and force as they did lack through most of our history. Um, so I'm going to make just two references to illustrate the, the dire situation that we face in the U.S. Um, the first I can summarize by uh, two words, one name, Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie has been under the fatwa since 1989, uh, has been exposed in countries all over the world because, among other things, he is amazingly brave and prizes uh, liberty, even above life, uh, with the risks that he's been willing to take. And it is so sad and so shocking to me that after all of these decades, where is he severely injured? Uh, and, uh, and sadly, I know that other people have been physically attacked and even murdered um, in other countries who are connected with the satanic verses. But for Rushdie himself, this is the very first time, and it happens not only in the United States, but in the heartland of the United States. I don't know how familiar all of you are with the geography, uh, the location where this brutal attack took place. It's in rural Western New York. And I know most people associate New York with the metropolis, New York City, but New York is an extremely large state and its Western reaches reach into the Midwest, the classic heartland of the United States and the uh, village where this took place, the Chautauqua Institution, is just your quintessential, peaceful, tranquil, serene uh, location, which to add insult to injury is specifically dedicated to open inquiry and diversity of viewpoints. So this was you know, an attack uh, in the heartland of my country, and in the heartland of the free speech, uh, intellectual freedom values for which Rushdie has so bravely stood up. <clears throat> and of course, you all know the irony that he was set to speak about how the United States has provided a refuge for writers who are under persecution and under threat elsewhere. Obviously, we can't provide that kind of sanctuary. And uh, we are all in this globally when even the most um, brutal, repressive regime can reach into our country, not only through the physical attack on Rushdie, but also the resulting chill, which is exactly the point of these kinds of terrorist attacks. I have absolutely no doubt that there's going to be a great self-censorship now, even more than there has been, uh, as a result of reasonable, sadly reasonable fear of the assassin's veto. 
Uh, the second uh, point that I will refer to to illustrate my, my broad theme um, has to do with uh, a week that we are now marking in the United States. Sometimes it's called Banned Book Books Week. Uh, sometimes we use more affirmative language to describe the same theme, uh, namely the Freedom to Read Week. It was organized by the American Library Association uh, many decades ago. And reports that were done this spring by the American Library Association, as well as by Pan America, show that we have record-breaking numbers of book banning incidents in public libraries and in public schools all over the country. And they are coming from all over the political spectrum as well. Uh, I spoke in my deep blue state of Connecticut on this theme last week, and librarians in Connecticut have been under pressure, although mostly, given the population and the politics here, mostly from the left. So a uh, librarian who was on my panel uh, said that she had been asked to and pressured to remove books by Flannery O'Connor, a celebrated Southern writer who was writing in the early to mid 20th century, chronicling what was going on in the United States then, um, in the Southern United States. And not surprisingly, she was chronicling a lot of racism not to endorse it uh, for the opposite reason. But that did not stop the uh, efforts to remove her, her books from the shelves. Um, the major theme, uh, most of the books that have been attacked, and we're talking about hundreds of incidents, uh, far more than in any year that the uh, these organizations have been tracking these incidents, uh, the vast majority of the attacks are on books that are by or about either Black law authors uh, and, and characters or even more LGBTQ. And here, uh, a, a charge that has been predominant at various points in American history, and I know Europeans think that we're, we're prudish and you make fun of us, as I do too. Um, namely, these books have been attacked as pornography and obscenity, and um, there even have been criminal prosecutions that have been launched against librarians. So far, none of them have succeeded, uh, but a number of librarians have quit because who wants to, you know, it's it, it, it fine if you're not actually indicted or prosecuted or convicted, but to be accused of engaging in uh, these, oh, and, and some librarians have actually been charged with child abuse for daring to expose young people to this kind of material. So it's becoming a rather, a fraught uh, thing to be a librarian in the United States in 2022, which is a very, very frightening um, prospect. So now turning to the, the glass half full, boy, how I wish this bottle really were half full at least, but metaphorically, it's always half full for me as an activist, you have to be an optimist. And, and it is precisely because the state of free speech has has become so unbattled that people who were taking it for granted are no longer taking it for granted. And the, the upside of this is that we have a flourishing of new organizations in the United States, new institutions that are dedicated to free speech, to classic liberalism, to open inquiry. And we also have expanded work by existing organizations. And there, the, to me, the most exciting example is FIRE, uh, which has existed for more than 25 years with an acronym standing for the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, because FIRE was focusing on campuses. But given the enormous increase in attacks on free speech, even beyond the campus fire last spring expanded its mission, kept the same acronym, but it now stands for the Foundation for Individual Right, uh, Individual Rights and Expression, in expression. Uh, I'm very thrilled and honored to accompany Jacob as we are the first two um, senior fellows at Fire, uh, consistent with to uh, to help in advancing this newly expanded mission. 
uh, other similar uh, new organizations. And, and sadly, the more the merrier because there's too much work to go around. So we're never competitive with each other. We're always collaborative and welcoming. And I'm involved in most of them. Uh, one is the Academic Freedom Alliance. One is the Alumni Free Speech Network. Uh, one that had just gotten off the ground when I was in your country last year, because I remember doing some uh, a lot of interviews about it. There is the University of Austin, which is going to be dedicated specifically to free speech. And it created a new sub-institution called the John Stuart Mill Institute. And they wrote to me and they asked how they can get these. Can they really, really, really want these caps? So you've got a good business proposition there at some point, Adam. Um, and many universities are adding institutes and departments uh, that focus on civic engagement and civil discourse. Uh, students and faculty from the grassroots up are, are starting these kinds of programs. Uh, just this week, I, I spoke at uh, a couple of them on very different campuses, but you see this as, as a theme on, on campuses. Uh, I think more publicity is being given to the students and faculty members who want to shut down free speech, and it's important. We really do need to hear about that as FIRE uh, issued just its latest comprehensive and disturbing report uh, showing that 63% of people on college campuses in the United States feel self-censored uh, about really important topics. But uh, it's important to know that there is pushback uh, and counteractivism at the campus level all over the country. So it, the quote under my email signature expresses the positive aspect of, of all of this, which is a uh, hope is more the consequence of action than its cause. And all of us are engaging in action and we have a lot of reason for hope. And for me, a certainly great hope springs from the action of Institute H21 and Jakob and this important uh, conference. So uh, just one other thing uh, about the, this conference, I know it was planned a long time ago, so I assume that this was a coincidence, Adam, but. From the U.S. perspective, the timing could not be more auspicious. I already alluded to the fact that we are now marking Freedom to Read a slash Banned Books Week, but we are also marking Constitution Week, the anniversary of the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. So uh, I always encourage a double-barreled ce celebration of both occasions by exercising your constitutional right to read a banned book or to read a book about banned books, uh, in particular, Jakob's great work. So uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations. I can't baptize the book in person, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do a double fisted toast here and say, uh, Nazdravi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nadine. And now I would ask Andrea to be your extended arm uh, down here in the Czech Republic to pop uh, the bottle of champagne and to, uh, to ba baptize the book. Do we have a copy? So normally the author ho holds the book and then the godmother, who is now <laughs> who is Nadine and Andrea by proxy, uh, <laughs> is going to pour all over it. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's how it goes. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a saying in the Czech Republic that broken glass brings luck. So uh, yeah, exactly, this is double luck for the book. Free speech, I suppose. <laughs> you can just drink from the bottle. Okay, now I declare the book baptized. So thank you. <laughs> All right, and we need to get. We need to get. Okay, while we're, we're in the process of tidying up, I would like to open a Q&A uh, session uh, for, for Jacob. So if anybody has any qu questions, and John does. Uh, 
Let's start. This isn't on. I don't think so. Is it on? It is. First of all, I want to thank you for the excellent talk, Jay. It was fantastic. Um, thank you. So um, when you came to the conclusion, um, there was a lot of convergence between what you were saying and what I'd been arguing. Um, but I wonder, I mean, I bumped up into this problem. Um, you said ultimately it's cultural and we need to, in some sense, be able to transform the culture. Um, the thing in the past that has done that has been religion. In fact, in many cultures, the, there's no distinction between the word for culture, the word for religion, the concepts. Um, given that we're in sort of, uh, in general, in, in some ways, a post-religious uh, situation, um, how do we go about taking up that functionality of changing the culture? And let me add one more point to it. Um, getting people to value free speech means you have to get them to value speech. And they have to find logos important and sacred and relevant again if they're going to value free speech. And so those two questions are uh, uh, connected in my mind. This yeah. general question of, okay, and I'm not advocating for a nostalgic return to religion, but what do we do in order to make logos sacred? And what do we do in order to transform a culture if we do not have the typical or the perennial religious machinery to do it with? Yeah, I, I think he, that is a crucial and, and difficult um, question. So, so you're right. You know, I think that <clears throat> one of the problems with free speech is that exactly it doesn't. Well, it binds us when we're when we're uh, when free speech is taken away from us when we're under assault. So it can bind a movement of dissidents and those who. Who, who toll under totalitarian regimes. That's bind us together. We want a new future for our country. Free speech is going to be the central value. Once you won that freedom, uh, take, take the founders of the United States, they would argue vehemently against the so-called slavery of, 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 of British speech restrictions. But once you once you gained your freedom, suddenly free speech doesn't bind you together, but it amplifies differences. Suddenly, uh, Adams, uh, ha Hamilton would, uh, would 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 go to war with with Jefferson and Madison, and they'd an, enact a sedition act to 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 put their former brothers in arms in 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 prison. Uh, so 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 that uh, and in that sense, it's you know it doesn't have the same social glue as patriotism, nationalism, or or, or religion. Um, I think one way maybe is to emphasize you know, the historical importance of it. So it becomes part uh, of your, uh, you know, what, what I would call a sort of benign tribalism <laughs> that, that is needed to bind us together and that, that free speech is a core component of it because that is what sets us apart from a darker path and what is absolutely necessary uh, for, for, for those other values that, 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 that bind us together. But, but I think Ultimately, free speech will have difficulties in competing with, uh, with, with some of the more potent social glue, including, unfortunately, benign forms of tribalism that, 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 are, prevalent, uh, uh, that are prevalent today. So I would love to work with you on, uh, and, and, and learn more about your work on, on how we can use it, not only as, 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 as an instrument to get there, but maybe even for, for it to, to have that role uh, in, an, in, in and of it, itself. But ultimately, I, I don't think also we would, we would wish to sort of worship free speech, right? Uh, to, to a certain extent, it has to be instrumental, but we still have to appreciate that the instrumentality of it is essential to, 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 the, to, to a good society. So, so I, I hope that makes sense. Thanks so much for these uh, very great points that you made. Uh, just, just two points that I think uh, may not have been mentioned or emphasized so much. Uh, number one is that one way to suppress free speech is to overload everyone with information so that you don't find this stuff. It's somewhere there, but you know, through the algorithms, it's just, you know, most people just won't get access to it. Is it something that is concerning you or is it something that where we can talk about some solutions and approaches. And the second thing is, maybe it's not directly related to your uh, uh, points, but I think someone's mentioned that, 
It's a free speech for children. I mean, should children have the same right as adults? Because I think some of these debates are there that some things, some, some things are withdrawn from children, but at the same time, that's been the case for cultural reasons all the time. I mean, yeah. Should we now abandon this in the name of free speech? Mm. So the last question, definitely not. I, my son was here earlier today. I'm a harsh censor in terms of what he can access. <laughs> and, and even more with my daughter, I don't want her to be sort of on, on Instagram uh, too much or TikTok and, and, and watch things that can sort of harm her, 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 her uh, self-image because she sort of compares herself to others. So, so you know, of course, there are, there, there are limits to, to, you know, where do you draw the, the exact line? But I, I definitely think there, there are good reasons why you would want to differentiate uh, free speech and access to information for adults and, and especially younger uh, children who are more vulnerable. But it's, it's the, the, I think the, the US debate, from what I understand, is whether yeah. the parent draws the line or the state or sure. the school. Which and, is the, and, the, and, and, and this is, but, but this is also, again, I think, you know, you ultimately want children. You want you want parents to take a, a more interest in the in the lives of of their children. I I think one of the problems in the U.S. is these educational gag orders, where sort of um, uh, curriculum, especially in Republican states, are now attacked. So so they they attack so-called critical race theory, and some of that might be born out of genuine concerns about what is being taught, about accuracy, and so on. But then the laws that are being passed tend to reflect uh, the orthodoxy of, 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 of the Republican side, and so it, it doesn't empower uh, parents. It's just uh, so so so, so um, that's why, hopefully, uh, you know, the in the best of all worlds, um, parents should 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 play that role, and you should, of course, you know. My son might come back from school having learned something where I have a completely different perspective uh, and I thought it was wrong. My first reaction is not going to be calling up the school and say, you know, you should fire that teacher. You know, I can uh, have a conversation with my son about it, find other types of information. Or if I think it's egregious, I can have a conversation with the teacher. You know, that's just that, that's a spirit of dialogue uh, and debate rather than, uh, than creating an, uh, an orthodoxy. Uh, and the first thing about information overload um, it's a, I, 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 you know, where, is, is, the, is the online digital age, is that, it's, it's a question, I don't have the perfect answer. Is it more overwhelming for us than, say, the advancement of the, of the, of, of the printing press? So I, in many ways, I think, you know, the, the, the digital age is a, you know, you go from the printing press, then you, you have sort of a, a mechanized uh, printing press, uh, then you have a telegraph, uh, and all of these things work, uh, work together, then you have radio uh, and so on, and, and, and cable TV, satellite TV, and then you come uh, into the digital age. So I think it was a long time ago, very long time ago, where any individual could hope to have just you know, an overview of all relevant uh, information uh, out, uh, th that, that was out there. You know, if you just see sort of the explosion of books and pamphlets that were printed in a relatively short time after the printing press, no one could, could, could have hoped to master uh, all the, uh, the, 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 the information. But, it's, but, but in a certain way, it's of course true that you can try to weaponize this by, 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 by drowning uh, people uh, in, uh, in, in information. And that's again why we need to empower um, people individually and collectively to have uh, a better antidote to, uh, to, to the weaponization of bullshit and, and, and misinformation. Uh, but I don't think there's any way to sort of legislate it, uh, really. Well, thank you for what you were, what you were saying. I would like to ask a pretty straightforward question, I think, to help not just me, but maybe all of us clarify your point of view on freedom of speech. And that is if your view on freedom of speech includes the right to tell lies. Very short answer, yes. Uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, almost, I would say, uh, because first of all, <clears throat> Who gets to define what is what what, what is what is truth? Uh, that that you know that's an, uh, a big responsibility, and and you can tell from history that you know those who have done so have not necessarily 
bit cared ab uh, uh, about truth. Now, uh, there might be specific instances where uh, lies can be, where, where can be combined with, for instance, incitement to violence. So if you were to say that um, the election was stolen and therefore you have to attack Congress and overturn uh, or attack the peaceful transfer of power in a democracy, if you do that in a way that incites a mob, you have an argument for saying, well, that's a, a restriction uh, of, of free speech. But uh, contesting the, the, the election with, with, uh, with, with, with lies or conspiracy theories in and of itself, I think should be, uh, should be protected speech. And also, you know, you can find all kinds of, you know, in, 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 in science, for instance, uh, where, where things that we believe to be absolutely the truth 10 or 20 years ago, uh, we, we get new uh, perspectives. And, you know, um, if, if we sort of stopped the time and said, this is the truth, uh, then I think uh, our societies would, would, would have suffered uh, under that. So, so, so yes, uh, in general, I think lies uh, should, be, uh, should, should, should be protected uh, speech. Of course, that does not uh, prevent you from going up against a lie. Uh, and I think actually I've been very encouraged by um, the development, for instance, of, of, of how open source uh, intelligence, uh, forensic digital journalists have grown with the task of countering Russian disinformation and propaganda, documenting war crimes and, and human rights violation almost in real time. I think it really shows that for, for, for democracies, I think free speech and access to information is a competitive advantage against authoritarian states. It looks to me as, as at least in Western or you know, open democracies, Russian propaganda is like, it's not very efficient. It, it, it might be different in, in other states, but it, it has really lost. You know, when I walk around Prague, you know, I see more Ukrainian flags than I, than I see uh, Czech flags. You see the, the same in, in, in many other uh, uh, democracies. And of course, that's also what we want. We want a citizenry that it, where, where the critical mass is able to look through what is crude propaganda, where we empower civil society rather than state agents uh, to uh, to be able to to document uh, war crimes, to document uh, propaganda, and get that uh, out there. Now, of course, we'll never be in a situation. I, I think it's really important also to just accept that free speech comes with a price. There are harms and costs involved. You can use your free speech for nefarious uh, ends, and if you're not willing to tolerate the potential bad effects down the line of what someone says then you cannot really have robust, uh, robust uh, free speech. But ultimately, I think you know, 2,500 years of, of history shows that this great experiment, counterintuitive probably to, to human nature and psychology of, of free speech, has been a benign one where, where the, the benefits have, have vastly outstripped the, the negative uh, sides. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you.